A couple of you I've told this story to before. I'm going to share it with all of you. I think I grew up with pretty good parents. In case they're listening to this as it's recorded and posted online, I had awesome parents. And for the most part, I would like to think, you would probably think otherwise, but I would like to think, I was a decent son. I mean, at least I got by. I have two siblings, both of whom are still alive today. That's a start. There was a time I can remember, though, one time that stands out in particular, when I was upset, I was ticked off, I was probably not in the best state of mind, and I decided I'm going to take the family van out for a drive. This is my course of action. Doesn't seem too bad up front, like I said, didn't hurt either sibling didn't spout off at my parents. However, the important detail was this was the family van. My parents did not have a lot of money growing up, and we had a used minivan, and it was one of those great minivans that goes down the road, and you're like, oh, people drive those, but the cool thing about it was it hauled our family, right? And we had one, so this was important. I was taking it for a drive in my pleasant state, and I hadn't had my driver's license too terribly long. Doesn't matter, though, because I'm an excellent driver. Some of you have trusted your children in my vehicle. <laughs> Nonetheless, here I am out on the road, and I'm playing the radio, and I think the problem was it was a broadcast of a Bears game. We're going to say that anyway. And I accelerated when the light turned green. Problem was there were three vehicles in front of me. I hit the first vehicle in front of me, and that's as far as I'll take the blame, because they hit the vehicle in front of them, and that person and whatever happened to the vehicle in front of them is their fault. Guess what? I was having a bad day. The problem is, okay, the problem is the van, mercifully, was still drivable, but once again, in case you missed it, I'll circle it, that was the family van. Still drivable, but I can't just go on driving around. I'm not in a better mood. And I got to return home. The good news, I had made it at least a half hour out, and I had time to concoct what happened. I was driving, okay, this is how it's going to go. I was driving when all of a sudden I'm in a red light, and ninjas, you know the ninjas that hide along that road, they just, just and that's not going to fly. Okay, I was driving along, the guy in front of me was intoxicated and backed into me and like pinballed into the car. That's not, physics doesn't like that. I'm going to have to own up to this. Right, that's the reality that set in, in my gut. I'm going to have to own up to this. There's no way around it. And you can't, I don't care who you are, I don't care how smooth you are, I don't care what kind of vehicle you drive, I don't care what your record is, I don't care. Because you can't just go home or go somewhere and tell another person you've wrecked their vehicle and just walk away from it. Much less when it's the family van. Like, shoot, my parents probably weren't any more proud of that vehicle than I was, but that's where we all fit into. Okay, that may not have been the most reliable or dependable or fun vehicle they had, but it's what we counted on, and I've wrecked it. And so I'm driving home, and 15 minutes have gone by, and the reality has just set in, and I'm like, okay, story, story, I'm grasping. Maybe they'll buy into the Bears broadcast, just setting everything off. Dad's a Bears fan. Ugh. I'm just going to have to tell him. And as soon as you accept that, there's nothing you can spin and nothing you can do, and it's not going to be pleasant. As soon as you accept that, you feel worse. There's nothing you can do. It's not going to be pleasant. I've got to tell them I wrecked the van. And I got a long life of driving ahead of me that they can pull to an abrupt stop for now. And I remember coming down my street, you know, you get into the neighborhood, oh, the sweat is beating. Coming down my street, and instead of just driving down the street, I'm like, <laughs> down the street, you know, like, I think the bumper just left. Hey, by the way, Eli, never. Never. Okay? And I'm coming down, and our house was at the bottom of a hill, 
And then there was this nice bend that you could round that I thought if I accelerate into, I can kind of like, you know, jet my way past. But there's no way. I'm like out of time, and there's nothing I can say, and I'm going to have to talk to my parents. Egad, what is that on the right at my house? It's my dad. Outside. Like, wow. So before I get to say anything, he's going to see the mess mobile. Heaven help me. What is my dad doing? He's mowing the yard. Some of you out there are like, I love yard work, okay? I've told you before, I despise yard work. My dad got that from him. He's mowing the yard. His mood is as low as it's going to get unless somebody's wrecked a vehicle. Oh! I remember just like if sweat was beating before, I was a river. I remember shaking physically. I was trembling. I had no good story for the first time possibly in my life. You people let me lie to you week after week. I had nothing I could say. And I pull up, and Dad walks to the window, and he's looking not at the vehicle, but at me. If you've ever seen lasers in a movie, like I can be, ow! And, and I stop, and I hit the brakes in front of the house. I'm not in the drive, just wanting to cry. Long and short of it, I just want to cry. By the way, I forgot this tiny detail, okay? I've got to say this, and here's an interesting fact that I need to disclose to my dad at some point in this sermon today. Dad, here's what happened. <laughs> um, I was young and inexperienced as a driver, no excuses, but here's what happened. I did not get insurance information or file a police report. I was like, oh crud, I'm in such big trouble, let's just get home. Okay? Sprinkle a little bit of that, stir it around, I want to stop right here. How do you think this interaction is going to go? Most of you have a face that's just like 10% of what was on my face. Like words were difficult to form. My jaw was hanging so low. The tears were right there. The sweat was everywhere. I'm like, Dad. I got in an accident. I remember the noise my dad made. Because he didn't have words. He made a noise, and it was like, <sighs> like someone had just come up, said, hello, sir, and kicked him in the gut. That is about what it felt like from my side. Like I drove up, got out of the van, said, hey, dad. Well, poof. I felt miserable, and I'm just waiting. Like I have three and a half seconds before his fist hits my face. <laughs> And he utters that noise, and for the both of us, I think the stomach just dropped out. I'm thinking, I disappointed him in such a big way. This is going to cost. And I didn't stop and get the insurance information and have the police file a report. Like, done. The thing in my family was, mom would not ride with us when we were learning to drive, okay? Pause the story there. There's my dad and I both feeling like, ugh, okay? Pause. Mom would not be in the vehicle with us when we were learning to drive. When mom did get in the vehicle with us, once we had our licenses, she would sit in the front seat, we would pull away, and she would unbuckle her seatbelt. I'd be like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, if you get in a wreck, you want me ejected because I will tear your face off. So she would, she would remove the restraining device. Mom would not, like could not, be with us up front unless it was absolutely necessary and there was no other way it was going to happen. She was nervous and she assumed from the minute the key hit the ignition, we had made a mistake. I love my mom, but I'm telling you, driving was not her thing with us. One time I had pulled into the driveway and I had pulled in a little too far and hit our garage door. My mom was in the front seat. That just reinforced her fears. When I was a little bit older, I had a car stereo installed and I had, you know, the woofers in the trunk and the amp going. And when it caused a short in the vehicle and the vehicle would not even start, my mom had been out driving it. Fast forward to this scenario. I am afraid of talking to my dad. I am worried about hurting my dad's feelings. But what I do not want is to have to say something to my mom. Like, I will take whatever dad has. I will give him the keys, let him sit in the driver's seat, lay on the road, and have him pull over me so long as I don't have to talk to mom. That's where I'm at. And darn those bears on the broadcast on the radio. 
Dad's response was that perfectly guttural, primal, and his next words, do you want to know what his next words were? I'm going to go talk to your mom for you. (laughs) You laugh. I wet myself. (laughs) The last thing in the world I wanted to do was have to present this to mom, and dad did that for me. I can use that story in a lot of ways, but I want to say one word, and I want to tie it to that, okay? Grace. Grace. If you don't know what grace is, it's when you don't get something that's coming your way in a bad way. If there's a punishment and you deserve it, grace steps in and saves you from that. My dad destroyed, much like the vehicle I was driving, stepped in for me and said, I'll talk to your mom. That's awesome. I think I had pretty good parents. I love my mom and dad, but I tell you what. Dad took one for the team. It wasn't the team. (laughs) The van took one for the team. And dad took one for me that day. I want to read this passage for you. This is not our biblical focus. It is not the main passage, but I want you to hear this, okay? With that picture of grace just floating around your mind, I hope. Colossians 3, 18 through 21. This is cool. It's like a biblical to-do list for the family. Listen to this. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. and Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord and your parents. Parents, Do not exasperate your children or they will become discouraged. There you go. That is about the summary of everything that I have been trying to say and you've been trying to hear over the last series. We've been talking about dynamic families. That pretty much wraps it up nicely. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents. Period. Always and forever. Parents, do not exasperate your children or they will become discouraged. That wraps up nicely the points I've been trying to make. And so you hear that, and it's kind of like the Cliff's version of the series I've been preaching. It's kind of like biblical family guidelines for dummies version of what I've been trying to communicate. And you're having one of two reactions. The first one is, why didn't he say that four weeks ago and save us all some time? The other reaction is what I'll call the yeah, but response, okay? And I would guess that most of you, not all of you, but I would guess that most of you have the yeah, but response. And it goes like this. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Yeah, but you don't know my husband. Okay? You don't know when he does this, and if you've ever seen him do this, and in public he does, okay, I don't want to submit to him. It's the yeah, but response. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be harsh with it. Yeah, but you don't know my wife. Okay, because my wife, like I have claw marks on my face. Okay? She is, she is not gentle with me. It is difficult to love without being beaten. So, yeah, I can love my wife, but it's children obey your parents, and children say, uh, look. <laughs> they don't do a yeah, but they're like, look. My parents. <sighs> okay, and I won't elaborate on that, but there are problems. Children obey your parents in everything, and they want to say, yeah, but how about in nothing, and we just go along. Or parents do not exasperate your children. Parents are like, but my children are exasperating. And you just want to build the circle, okay? A lot of you hear that, and you're like, that's great. Pastor Devin, you're talking in an ideal world. This is not an ideal world. The reality that we often find, again, not always, but we often find is this. Wives want to assert their authority and just move past their husbands. Husbands aren't necessarily harsh with their wives. Sometimes they're just not present for their wives. Children, instead of obeying, sometimes have expectancies of things. They want things. They feel they're entitled to things. Or, and children are great about this, they find the loopholes. I'd love to obey you, but Clause C, Section A, Paragraph 1B, allows me the freedom, you know, Parents are exasperated themselves. They run themselves ragged. Sometimes it's under the guise of doing what's best for the children. Sometimes it's cramming so much in, they are tired, they are spent, and then they exasperate their children. Grandparents think, what the heck is my child doing with his children? I raised them better than that. They know better than that. Why are they doing this? 
And in all of these family, in all of these situations, family dynamics come into play. And the gift of a safe environment and a loving family where we can all learn from each other and grow together becomes something totally separate. And we wish for, we long to have dynamic families. And we hear those instructions from Colossians and we say that would be great, but that's talking in ideals. And I said this at the outset, I plan on using ideals. I plan on talking about what would be perfect because that's how God talked about, that's how Jesus talked about God. That's how Jesus talked about the kingdom. That's how Jesus talked about the world should be. Talked in ideals. Like the kingdom of God is like this, so try and live like this. Not that you're there. I can't remember the teaching where Jesus said, you're doing this perfectly. But he'd say, God Our Heavenly Father is like this, so be like this, and lifted up those ideals. And so one last time, I'm lifting up ideals to say, let's aim for those. And right now, in case you would ask or feel bad, right now when you're saying, but wait a minute, I'm going to fall short, or so-and-so will fall short, or my children's is will fall short, I'm telling you, that's why Jesus died. He said, you're not going to make it. You're not going to be perfect. In fact, I love you all, Jesus would have said, but none of you are good enough. There's going to be a gap. Strive for that. Aim for that. And when you fall short, I will give my life. That's the way it happens. So if I can talk one last week in ideals of how we want to relate to each other and what we should see, what a dynamic family is, I'd share with you this story. Not from my own life but one that Jesus told in Scripture. It's called the prodigal son. And it goes like this. Luke chapter 15. Jesus told this story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed his pigs. The son was so hungry, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I'm starving to death? I'll go out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So this is what he did. He got up and returned to his father, but... While he was still a long way off, and I want you to hear that, while he was still way off in the distance, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, the servant replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, Father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders because I've read scripture. I imagine he threw in there really nicely. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, 
who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. How many of you, just for curiosity, how many of you have heard that story before? Okay. And you get the long version of it and you get the short version of it and that's the version told in Luke 15 and that's how it goes. And Jesus tells this story to talk about an ideal to talk about how God interacts with us. And initially, it's not a good scenario, right? I mean, think of your own response. Yes, you're in church. That means you have to be honest. Leave the expletives out, though. Okay? I want you to picture your child coming to you and basically saying, you're dead to me. Give me a portion of everything that you've got, and I'm off. I want you to picture your response. If one of your children comes up and says, hey, Forget you. I don't care about you. This is how I want to live. Give me what's mine, and let's part ways. I want you to picture in your mind, how do you want to respond there? You feel disrespected. They have not treated you kindly. And they're going to go off and do who knows what, because you know that child. It's that child. You know what they're going to do when they get this stuff. How do you want to respond? It's not a good scenario to begin with. But think of all the great things that happen as this story is told. Think of all the great things that Jesus lays out in the story. And don't miss the keys of like having a dynamic family here. Okay, the son realizes his mistake. There are many, many times when my children make mistakes that I'm just happy if they realize that was a mistake and then they learn from it. The son realizes his mistake and then he comes back and apologizes. Wonderful. This is good. The father doesn't just say, you messed up when the son returns. The father sees him in a distance and runs to him, okay? Not like the the tapping foot, like, oh, oh yeah, he's coming back now, okay? Not even will negotiate, like go straight to your room and I might talk to you in three and a half years. Father runs to him with his arms open and forgives him. The brother, of course, there's always the jealous brother. I know this because I have a brother. (laughs) The brother states that he's always obeyed his dad. I'm sure he played that whole deck of cards, okay? Jesus just gave us the quick version so we could grasp the concept. I'm sure that brother laid out all the things. I mowed the yard last week, dad. I was the one that said, you know what he's going to do with that money, dad? Did I mention that I am the one that brought you the newspaper, dad? And you know, all the things he'd done right. But the son, he's bitter about it. He's always obeyed his dad. But what happens is he finds a deeper relationship with his dad. And we don't know that he forgives his brother because it's not in the story, but he's able to talk some of his bitterness out, and he's able to be a part of the celebration. That much we know. And how about, let's not forget, how about the dad's character in this story? How about the dad's character? Just to embrace a son that's more or less spit on him and welcome him back, And not just welcome him back, but throw a party? Wow. Wow. A dad that when the other brother starts arguing, he's like, I want to celebrate. And he gets, me, 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 me. He doesn't say, shut up. And he doesn't say, go to your room. Or he doesn't give him the dad flogging out back. Like, that's going to be this paddle right here. Anyway, you know, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. He he explains, like, okay, this is why we're doing this. I know you're upset. I'm going to celebrate with him, and here's why. And you should celebrate too. He reasons it out. The dad gently corrects the brother and reminds him in the midst of it, hey, you know, when you're upset, like the last thing you want to do is kind of talk it out. But if you can go that far, the last thing you're going to do is share what you have. But he says, everything I have is yours. Okay, son, you've been here. You have been faithful. I have always been with you, and anything I have, you can have. And he throws the celebration for everyone. Throws the celebration for the servants, for the other brother, for the son that's returned. We assume for the entire household. Throws the celebration. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. There's been turmoil. And this dad has the character, has the grace to take it all in and turn it around to a celebration. Everyone wins except for the fattened calf. It's a price you pay. 
This is a story about a family set right and grace deeper than anything that you can imagine. The grace exhibited in this story, I don't know if you can put yourself into that mindset, if you can think about that scenario or not, but the grace exhibited in the story goes deeper than anything you can imagine. Like I said, for me, it was a pretty big step when dad got past his guttural noise and said, I'll talk to your mother. This is a dad who has a son just walk away, spend half of his stuff, say, I'm leaving the home, come groveling back, and has the grace to say, no, you're part of the family, and we're so glad you're back. And this is what I want to ask of you based on this story. This is what I want to ask you. Women, how many of you could submit to a husband like that? It shows that kind of love. Has grace and mercy and just depths of riches and is willing to give them to someone that doesn't deserve. That turns a terrible situation into a celebration when it's put right. That manages to get the household back in the right spirit. Women, how many of you could submit to a husband like that? Men, how many of you could model enough grace to handle all those tensions in such a way? I'm sorry if I'm really, really honest for the first time in church. If I'm really, really honest, that would be so tough when the sun comes back and like, okay, the land was in famine and I don't have anything years left, but I want to come back, Dad. Oh, man. To just go, yeah, and to embrace him and to even run, that's hard. That's something that comes from deep down. That's guts like deep inside, if you can do that. Men, how many of you have that kind of love? could model that kind of grace and extend that kind of love to your entire family. Children, is that a parent that you could obey? Children, if you had a dad that was that compassionate and that concerned for your well-being and that sharing, is that the type of parent you would want to obey? Some of you say, I know, Pastor Devin, I know you're talking in ideals. And some of you in your hearts are saying, but listen, you don't know what type of family I grew up in. You don't know the situation I was raised with. Some of you children are saying, you don't understand what happens at home. Some of you are saying, but my wife, but my husband, and you're back to the yeah, but argument. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You may long for and you may wish for a dynamic family, and you're saying, but here's reality. And my reality right now seems like a lot more accessible than your ideal you're talking about. Here's what I want to tell you. Reality is that whole story is a picture of how God treats us. That story says you do have that type of family. Dina talked with the children about a church family. I'm saying to you, if you choose... You have a heavenly Father who is the ideal, who is perfect, who will receive you like that, who will always love you. Some of you have chosen not to follow in Jesus' ways. Some of you have chosen not to acknowledge that Father yet. Some of you are saying, I don't get that and I don't feel that way, but I'm telling you, that is reality. God says, I will not stop loving you. I will extend mercy to you. I will call you my own child and I will show you what a good father is like. And it's up to you simply to accept that and to live into that. And some of you are saying, yes, I already accepted that, but that doesn't help me because my grandchildren, I'm telling you, these kids aren't going to grow up right. I see what's happening. And you're saying, yeah, but with my own children at home. Yeah, but with my husband, with my spouse. And here's what I'm going to tell you again. If you've accepted that, then you have the 100% perfect model to follow. Jesus told that story once again to show how God works. Jesus says, you can be like this. So if you're here this morning, if you have children, if you have grandchildren, you have a husband, you have a wife, okay, you have parents, not everybody's lucky enough to have me as a dad. Just did that. If you're here this morning and you're saying, I want a better family, I talked about how that starts, it's founded in, it's rooted in guidelines that are bigger than us. It starts in God. 
talked about how husbands and wives can love each other, talked about how children should obey their parents and parents, how you can raise children, and even people that aren't parents, you can have influence on a child's life. And what I'm saying to you to wrap it up is we have a model. We have an example. We have grace upon grace upon grace of how we can live We can have that in God our Heavenly Father. We can show that to the people we live with. And just when you think, I can't do it, like that's God, that's not me, I don't have it in me, or all the yeah buts, I'm telling you, if you want that to be reality, then work towards it. Live into it. Read it. Think about it. Act it out. Change patterns. Put this into place. If you say, okay, okay, wait. I'd love a father like that, but you don't know my past. Again, it doesn't matter. Let this be your new starting point. If you say, boy, Pastor Devin, I appreciate what you've been saying the past few weeks, but you should see the dynamics that are at play in my family. The Bible's right there with guidelines, and I've tried to share some of those to say it can be better. Even if you think it's good, it can be better. And this is what God calls us to for the bitterness that tries to pry families apart. It speaks of sharing what we have, being included equally, and treated with love by a father of great wealth, and that's our story. For those of you that follow Christ, that's our father. For those of you that are outside of that, I'm proposing step on in and be a part of the family. I have that quote in the bulletin, and I put it in there twice, and it's not that I forgot, but I love it. The same Jesus who turned water into wine can transform your home, your life, your family, and your future. He is still in the miracle-working business. His business is the business of transformation. If I could identify two things that I've wanted to do with this series is to say to you, there is hope wherever you at. If, you're, if you feel you have a good family, there's hope that it can be even better. If you feel like you've had a terrible family, there's hope for it. If you feel like I am just hopeless and without like, any direction, God is there and there is hope. Two things that I'd identify from the series. One, there is hope. Two, Scripture gives us guidance on how to be as a family. So I offer you that story about my father and the grace that he showed me. And I offer you that story from Scripture about God and the grace he shows each of us. And I'm calling you, live into that. Enough of the current reality, enough of the hurt, enough of the pain. There's forgiveness and there's a new day. Live into what Jesus lies out for us. And we can have hope. And we can model a different life to the world. And we can have dynamic families. And we can find the connection that we've been lacking with our children. The connection and the bond that's been lacking as husband and wives. The difficulties that we see in our grandchildren's life. We can speak hope into them. All of those things can be turned around. We can have that. We have the perfect model. We've been given that kind of grace.